Hey, I believe in miracles, and I hope you do too, because you are a miracle. And in the Bible, we have 37 miracles that Jesus did in his lifetime, recorded in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're well worth reading and figuring out what's the difference here, what's the tipping point in each and every one of them. I believe that the 38th miracle is the fact that Jesus loves me. But I believe that just being alive is a miracle. So each and every one of us are a miracle because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, and I, I think God is working on some more miracles in your life. You may think, well, I'm just number 38. Uh, no, I think that there's a lot. Some of us are working on number 40, 50, maybe even 100. Uh, we are miracles. And um, of the miracles we've looked at so far, which one has spoken to you, uh, helped you, encouraged you, made a difference in your life? Uh, I think of all the miracles in my life. I, I have two children by birth and one by adoption, and I just say miracles, miracles. And the fact that we're alive, that things are going well, that we are blessed, those are miracles. It's not just luck. It's it, To me, it's miracles. Uh, today, I want us to look at Luke chapter 7, starting verse 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to the town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd were went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bearer. They uh, were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding uh, country. So, um, I think before we look at what's the tipping point of the story, I think we need to look at some of the other things in this story that are very important. This mother, something unique about her, she's a widow. Uh, what, what, would, uh, um, what, would, what would make the death of her son so difficult? Well, not just did she have a loss of life and have to pay funeral expenses or however they did that at that time, but this was a support system that was taken away from her, and it was a dashing of all of the dreams and hopes that she had. And what stands out about the son is this was her only son. She had no other children. She had lost her husband. She had lost her, her son. She had lost her support. She had lost her hope. So what do you think the tipping point of this miracle is? I don't think there's just one miracle here. I think one of the other miracles is how the people were in awe of what Jesus had done. What if Jesus told you, get up? I think that's really the tipping point when Jesus says, get up, and then all of a sudden he gets up. Uh, may, maybe there is something that uh, has been um, cutting you. Maybe there is something that a, a broken relationship, a heartache, a letdown, a setback, a screw up. And Jesus says, get up. And then there's something about that kind of power, knowing that Jesus doesn't just have the power to resurrect himself, which happens later in the Bible, but he has the ability to resurrect stuff in us that may be dead. Maybe it was a dream to do something. Maybe it was a career goal, but life got in the way and you uh, didn't get the right score to get into the school that you wanted to. And now Jesus is saying, get up. Maybe it means you've got to go back and you've got to try again. I, I think sometimes it is our idols that keep us from getting up. We, we think of idols as little statues, little shrines, or something else that becomes extremely important to us. And we, we don't think of it as uh, being harmful, but we can't see it, see what it really is. It isn't, we don't feel like it's really holding us back, but it might be holding a lot of people back that don't realize it. I think one of the idols of my life has been that um, I fear what other people think about me and um, whether other people like me. And um, I heard a long time ago that if I stood on my head and spit out quarters, some people would complain. We're always going to have people that are complaining. Some people would complain if their ice cream was cold, right? Some people look for things to complain about, and there's others that would complain if they didn't have something to complain about. You know who they are. Hopefully it's not one of you. You can't please everybody, but if you want to get up, Look into how to please God 
and not worry about pleasing anybody else and try to please God with everything that you've got. Now, I believe if we're going to get up, it's going to require that we sit at the bottom of our, uh, what we call the triangle, sit in intimacy with God the Father with pencil and pen. And we begin to ask God, what dreams and hopes of mine do you want to resurrect? Uh, what ones do I need to just let it go uh, and, and quit wallowing in sorrow for? Which ones do you want me to celebrate? And which ones do you want me to thank you for the protection over? Which things of my past that didn't work out the way I want, do you want me to just celebrate and thank you for? Because you have a better plan and you still have a plan for me. Uh, what, what dreams have you given up on in life? And I think everyone's had a dream or ambition or an expectation that didn't happen. And the easiest thing to do is tuck it away and forget uh, what you wanted to and carry on. But sometimes God whispers and he invites us to start um, hoping again. Verse 16, it says, God has come to help his people. They saw what God did in this young man, and they clear, it, clearly God was on the move, and they saw it's time. If he can get up, it's time for us to get up and get on the move with him. And when Jesus said this to the young man, the young man obeyed him. And if we will be attentive to what God is wanting to do in us and through us, people will see that God is on the move, and we get up, and they can get up. I think one of the reasons we give up on our hopes and our dreams is that we begin to listen to the wrong voices around us. Satan is a liar. He is the father of all lies. Uh, Psalms 23 is a very powerful, powerful passage of scripture. We, we tend to hear it at uh, funerals and stuff, but think about this. It says in verse five, very powerful thing. He says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. It's a table for two people, not for a crowd. It's for you and God, the father. And when, when, when he and I, go out and we have our staff meeting. It's just the two of us. And uh, we go out and, and, and it, it, um, it's very possible that while we're there, somebody will want to come up and talk to us. And, and I can't complain because I'm guilty of going and visiting with other people when I go into a restaurant because I thought that that was what I'm supposed to do. And I'm realizing maybe I'm an interruption that they don't need. Maybe I ought to just wave to them and say hi. But if you want to pick up my tab when I'm at staff meeting, go ahead. We always appreciate that. But the enemy is going to tell you that you're no good. The enemy is going to try to steal that seat at the table and tell you, well, those opportunities have passed. You can't rebuild those. You can't do that. Uh, and the enemy is going to tell you a million other lies. And it's hard to think differently because you've become so used to his voice, so used to hearing all of that negativity from the enemy. And no matter how much truth you hear, you continue to believe the lies of the enemy. Well, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we demolish arguments and every uh, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. How do we do that? Well, I think that we, can, uh, we need to take captive the good thoughts and make the bad thoughts obedient to Christ. What would it look like to take the captive's thought, uh, the, the, those thoughts captive in your life? Well, what if we just started replacing them with the name of Jesus? Um, and look at through scripture of the I am statements. Look at how the Bible tells us that we're accepted, that we're secure, that we're significant, that we were chosen, that we have been adopted by the Most High God. And the only way to know a counterfeit it's to surround yourself with the truth, the real thing. So do you believe God cares about your dreams? Do you trust that he can bring new life and resurrect what, was, what has been left laying there? Our thoughts and our dreams that we have uh, put on the back burner are things that we can share with a trusted friend. And as a trusted friend, your job is not to fix them. Your job is not to suggest to them what they need to do or give them a 10-step program is to join them in prayer. Your job is to help them hear what the Holy Spirit is talking to them and saying to them about it. Some of the dreams are not going to work out. And, and what, uh, what, whatever it was, was not God's rejection. I think it was God's protection. So we need to thank him. And I encourage you to pray that you will be open to whatever God wants to renew in you because he still does have a plan for you, a plan to prosper you and do you good, not to harm you because you are loved with an everlasting love. Don't forget, I love you, God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Have an awesome day.